Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So they call this passage in Scripture the Temple Incident. I've got one of those Bibles that has, uh, has headlines on there, and they call it the Temple Incident. And so it was Monday this week when I you know, opened the Bible, and I'm looking what I've got to preach on this week, and I see the Temple Incident on there. And, uh, and it gave me a chuckle, because when I heard the Temple Incident, my first thought was, oh good, it isn't just my family. Because my family has this habit of uh, naming our catastrophes and disasters narrowly averted, and that's exactly what we're dealing with here today. Maybe your family has similar names for similar catastrophes. We have lots of them. There's the rice pudding incident, and the Christmas tree kittens incident. No kittens were hurt in the making of this uh, incident. We have the bungee strap incident. One big brother was hurt in the making of that one. There's the Operation Flamethrower incident, the Bedroom Golf incident, the BB Gun incident, the Buzz Cut incident. Uh, Maybe I'll tell you about them someday. But today, it'll suffice to say that these incidents, like the Temple incident, are occurrences where time must have slowed down and reality's veil became paper thin. Am Am I seeing what's happening going on? When life brushed right up to the edge of sure and certain disaster when you see it all happening and are helpless to act we've all had that experience and you've held your breath and you've prayed a silent prayer invoking god's presence to deliver right now lord today's incident bubbles up when jesus pushes back against the people's lack of reverence for god clearly not a new issue And in turn, the people are appalled at Jesus' lack of reference for the temple. For the people, the question isn't what is sacred, but rather where is sacred. And for them, uh, the sacred was in this building. And that's that's one of the the difficulties we all deal with. Right, we see, um, we say that, what's that saying, um, you know, show me what you spend your time on, and then I'll tell you what your values are. We value those things that we spend our time on, and they spent a lot of time on this temple. Forty-six years this has been under construction, they say. And somewhere along the way, when they built this temple for God, the temple became God to them. This temple was a sacred space. It was a place where human life and divine blessings met. And that was how it was supposed to work anyway. While the Roman leaders and the Jewish authorities in their retelling of this incident would most likely point to the actions of Jesus as the incident, Jesus would say that his actions were simply a response to his father's house being turned into nothing but a market. And a place to offer sacrifice to their idol. So you see our dilemma. These incidents get all wound up, and that's what they do to us, too. So we're going to take a couple of minutes to unwind this one. It all began at the temple. For Israel, the temple in Jerusalem was supposed to be God's permanent dwelling place. We hear the story about Moses leading God's people through the wilderness, and uh, God was located in this ark, and he traveled. And they met the promised land. They finally made it to the promised land. They decided that God needs a permanent home. It's a sign of that covenantal promise of God's eternal presence, and that this was where that promise came to be. The sacrificial rites there were administered according to biblical laws by priests who were descended from priests— Jews throughout the known world made pilgrimages here at at feast times, and the temple became a powerful symbol that bound Jews all over the world in a common identity. At the same time, the temple priests evoked resentment because of their inherited status, their connection during Jesus' life to the Roman authorities, and their distance from those who suffered under imperial powers. 
they were effectively cut off from the people that they were supposed to be serving, and they really didn't even have much say in the religious matters either. Roman officials appointed the chief priest, and that chief priest served their interests. And if he didn't, well, then they just appointed another one. You know how that goes. Roman coffers benefited from the marketplace that supported these sacrificial rites. So a disruption at the marketplace, at the temple court, during a festival season like Passover, well, it affected Rome's revenues. The Romans controlled Israel. They controlled the people. They controlled the temple. Right up to the year 70 A.D., when the people had had enough, they rebelled, and the Romans tore the temple apart and burned it to the ground. Now, these Gospels that we have today were written after the devastating loss of the temple in the Jewish war against Rome. According to John, Jesus asserts that he himself is the temple. That Rome did not destroy Jesus by crucifying him. And the temple lives on in Jesus Christ. In John's gospel, the body of Jesus is the new temple, this holy place. The word became flesh and lived among us, John writes. In the incarnation, when the spirit came and lived in the flesh, with the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, God's dwelling place, His eternal dwelling place then, right? That's what the temple is, the eternal dwelling place. It's with human beings, as a human being. We see a picture of Jesus who knows what it is to to come down, knows that the temple won't last forever, knows that life and faith don't depend on a building, but on a relationship with God. And so he sees that this building has become their God, and he baits those Jewish leaders. I dare you, right? He baits them with the thing that's of most value to them. I dare you, tear down this temple. Tear down this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. This is a familiar story. This is one of the few that's uh, in all four of the gospel writings, so you know it's important. It's so familiar that it's easy to miss a major element of how it figures in John's gospel, distinct from the other three. Because John is all about telling his people that that Jesus is the holy place, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that Jesus is the the, the, the final sacrifice. Because Jesus, the Word made flesh, the Lamb of God, because he's on the scene, you no longer need to make sacrifice. Jesus goes beyond the law given by Moses and offers both grace and truth. So these other external sacrifices aren't relevant anymore. They don't do anything, he says. Jesus offers his body, his heart, his life for the sake of God's love. And he challenges us to do the same. He offered that there's more to life than what goes on behind the curtain. That no matter what gets torn down and destroyed, God never stops creating life out of death. Hear that again. God never stops creating life out of death. The temple, in order to work, it had to function as a place of exchange for maintaining and supporting the sacrifice structures required for preserving that idea of relationship with God. See, the orderly transactions of a marketplace were absolutely essential for the temple to survive. But the question Jesus asks is, does that building need to survive? Can you survive if that building does not survive? And the answer is yes. Should it survive? Certainly not when it makes people unable to see that God is interacting with God's people in a new way, in a way that no longer requires sacrifice at the temple because Jesus, the Lamb of God, has come not only as the last sacrifice, but also to hand over God's imaginable and unexpected grace here and now. 
He calls the temple my father's house. Yet he intimates to all of us that God is first and foremost present in his body and by extension, our bodies. Which is to say that God is first and foremost present here. And if God is present here, then God will be present wherever we go. So if God is not present in your heart, he's not going to be found in your church either. I mean, that's a hard word. That's a challenge to keep Jesus first. If we do not have Christ first, then God is nowhere. Or more accurately, he's not seen by us anywhere. But if we are in Christ, and my friends, we are, and Christ is in our hearts, then God is present everywhere. This temple incident is about a group of leaders who say, you will not find God out there because God is in here, and in here only. Because they can't see God out there, Jesus challenges that they aren't going to see God anywhere. And they don't see. They can't. That's why he's so offensive to them. It's because he says, God isn't just located in this one spot, but all over. This incident occurs because they won't allow that God can do a new thing. They won't allow that God would do a new thing. The surprise in today's gospel is that Jesus says that the transcendent, eternal, the divine, is present in his body. The Gospel of John makes this claim that a human body, unique, but also a lot like your body or mine, is the holy place of God. Jesus was not just wearing a human body like a set of clothes. He was a human body. As inseparable from his body as you are from yours. And God was inseparable from him. You see the connection there? That means that God is inseparable from us. During the season of Lent, we follow. Right? That's what Lent is about, following Jesus to the cross. We follow the body of Jesus as he travels to Jerusalem, as his hand his hands braid a piece of rope into a whip to herd cattle and sheep out of the temple, as his knees then bend at the feet of the disciples to wash them. We watch him eat and drink with his friends. We follow him to the garden where the bodies of his disciples unsuccessfully try to fight off sleep while Jesus sweats through a prayer that he might not have to endure the torture that he knows is his in him in his immediate future. We see him beaten, crucified, taken down from the cross, laid in a tomb, and the stories of his resurrection, still a body, huggable, touchable, scarred, eating, breathing, speaking, still loving. In all these events, Jesus is the location of God and the point of connection between divine and human life. As we allow God, then, to find us in the temples of our own hearts, the world becomes a sacred temple for God who so loved this world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him, calls upon him, acknowledges the divine presence in their own hearts, sees the fingerprints of God wherever they might look, may not perish, but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen.